Welcome to my talk about collaboration in kernel mailing lists. I have posted this on my website. So if you go to Fast Wonder blog and click the speaking link, you can get the slides. So no worries about taking notes. And there's also going to be a video posted afterwards. So I'm working at VMware now. But for this talk, I'm going to spend some time going through the research I did for my PhD a couple of years ago. And this is research started in 2015 when after spending 20 years working in technology, I decided to take a little break from working and go back to school to get a PhD. So that's what I did for my midlife crisis. I spent about three and a half years at the University of Greenwich in London on this research, which is focused on better understanding how Linux kernel developers collaborate with each other when many of them work for competing companies from locations around the world in various different situations. And this is what I'm going to talk about today. First, I'll start by telling you just a bit about me. As I mentioned, I spent more than 20 years working in technology. And most of that time, I've been working on open source projects from within a variety of different companies. And after finishing my PhD, I joined Pivotal, which was acquired by VMware at the beginning of the year. And I've been working on various open source community strategy projects. In the past, I've been director of community at Puppet and community lead for Intel's Open Source Technology Center. I ended up working in open source sort of accidentally. I managed to luck into a Unix sysadmin role at a local manufacturing company as my very first job out of university back in the mid 90s. And at that time, manufacturing companies just did not want to spend money on IT. So most of the tools that I used were open source. A few years later, when I was at Intel, I ended up on a project to look at which Linux developer tools, especially the open source tools, were likely to be important for Intel in the future. Since I had used open source tools and I had a Unix background, which was similar enough to Linux, they threw this project in my direction. And a huge part of the evaluation was related to the community. Is there an active community? Are there regular releases? Are there users for the tools? And I started to get more and more fascinated with how these communities worked. And when I first started using open source, how a bunch of random people threw code together and actually ended up with something that not only worked, but worked really well, was a complete mystery to me. Now, as I started looking more closely, I realized that there's actually quite a bit of structure with committers and maintainers that just wasn't obvious from the outside looking in. And I started getting more and more fascinated by how these open source communities worked. And I started blogging about open source and speaking at conferences, which led me to my next open source job. And from there, the rest of my jobs were focused mostly on open source communities. Now, fast forward to today, where I'm working on open source strategy at VMware. As part of that work, I'm also a Kubernetes contributor active within the contributor experience special interest group. I'm also a board member of Open UK which I'll talk about a little bit later. And they're focused on developing and sustaining leadership in open technology here within the UK. I'm a governing board member and maintainer for the Linux Foundation's Chaos Project, which is focused on using metrics to evaluate the health of open source projects. And I'm on the advisory board for Paturgia, which is a company that uh, does open source health metrics. Uh, Dawn, can I um, jump in? I think we are still saying, still thinking of your first slide. Oh, you're moving on. I'm afraid we're not moving on with you. Um, yeah, I don't, I don't know. Oh, there we go. That's it. We can now see about my research. Oops. 16 kernel interview. Uh, sorry. Now I can't see my screen. <laughs> ah, okay. about, we, we can see that. Now? Yeah, that works. See. Okay, perfect. Fantastic. Um, let me see. Okay, there we go. Um, so, so when I worked in the Open Source Technology Center at Intel, we had quite a few kernel developers on the team. And I was always interested in how they worked so closely together with other people from a wide variety of companies, including our competitors. One of the interesting things about the Linux kernel is that the vast majority of people who contribute to the kernel are employed by companies to do this work. However, a lot of the academic research on open source software 
tends to assume that participants are volunteers contributing because of some personal need or altruistic motivation. And while this is certainly true, absolutely true for some projects, based on my experience, I know that this assumption just is not valid for many projects like the Linux kernel and OpenStack and Kubernetes, for example. When I talk to kernel developers, they almost always say that it's the contributions that are important, not your employer. And as a part of my PhD research, I interviewed 16 kernel developers, and most of them said they don't really pay much attention to where someone works. So from a more practical standpoint, I wanted to test this idea out a bit and use my PhD to explore whether where you work, along with a bunch of other factors, influences how people work together in the kernel. As I mentioned, I did 16 interviews. When selecting people to interview, I wanted to get a wide range of people from a variety of different types of companies, but with a focus on people who are experienced kernel developers employed by a company to develop kernel code. So most of my interviews were with maintainers. I interviewed three women, the rest were men. The matching maintainer and gender numbers are indeed a coincidence since two of the women I interviewed were maintainers. The people I interviewed were from a variety of company sizes, locations, some of the sectors included semiconductor, consumer electronics, application software, networking products, nonprofit, storage, and a bunch of other sectors. For the people I interviewed, most of them said that physical location is not important since collaboration happens on mailing lists where people respond asynchronously. However, some people are aware of time zones for key people they work with often, but most also claim that time zones don't really matter that much. For example, one person said that they know really well which person is in which time zone, and they use this information to know when to expect replies. But they also said that they don't really work more closely with people who are online at similar times. Several people mentioned that by using mailing lists, which are email-based and asynchronous, it makes it easy to collaborate with people across multiple time zones. And given the current pandemic, I think we're seeing more examples of this since most people working for technology companies have been working for home, from home for months. Almost all of the people interviewed, with only a couple of exceptions, considered their affiliation with the Linux kernel to be more important than their relationship with their employer. So they consider themselves a Linux kernel developer first and employee second. Anyone who's spent much time around kernel developers has probably witnessed this in action as people jump from one company to the next while still continuing to do very similar work within the kernel. Even when they enjoy their current job and really like their employer, they still tend to look at the relationship with an employer as something that's a bit temporary, while their identity as a kernel developer was viewed as something more permanent. Many people receive very little direction for their day-to-day -day work with a high degree of trust from their employers to do useful work without much direction. However, they are occasionally asked to do some specific piece of work or maybe take an interest in a particular area that's important for the company. In the cases where someone's asked to do something specific, it was described by one participant as being asked to provide support in the kernel for features X, Y, and Z. With management, not really caring how it was implemented. And this shows that while companies do sometimes influence the areas where employees contribute, individuals have quite a bit of freedom in how they do the work. This depends a bit on the type of company and the type of work too. For example, I talked to a couple of consulting companies and sometimes the client work is very specific, but they also allowed their employers to work on pet projects within the Linux kernel in between their client contracts. In all of the interviews, participants mentioned that they worked with, that there were people that they worked with more closely than others, which you know is similar to just about every job I've ever had. In some cases, these were strictly professional relationships, but in others, they later developed into friendships. Almost all of the participants talked about how existing relationships, both professional and friendship, made it easier to collaborate with other Linux kernel developers. All of the participants mentioned in-person collaboration at conferences and other meetings as something that was important. 
While important technical discussions should be on the mailing list, people talked about how it's sometimes easier to walk through really difficult big issues in person at conferences. Now, this is one that's definitely become more challenging given the current environment with meetings being online and conferences being virtual like this one, uh, which puts a damper on a lot of the social activities that go along with meeting people in person. But we're, I say we're making do the best we can. Most of the participants collaborate with their competitors on a regular basis. And they talked about how within the Linux kernel, they interact with each other on a personal level as individuals. One person even mentioned that one of their company's competitors hadn't had as many kernel contributions as they would like. And another mentioned that they had recently invited their primary competitor to a Linux kernel meeting at their company because the competitor was working on similar challenges that they both would benefit from resolving. This was something I saw a lot of when I was working at Intel, since our kernel developers work with really all of our major competitors. In most cases, people weren't concerned about whether a person works for a corporation, a nonprofit, an academia, or whether they were an individual hobbyist. As a result, sometimes people don't really know much about where other people work or if they're hobbyists. For people who use corporate email addresses, their corporate affiliation is generally obvious, unlike people who are using personal email addresses like Gmail addresses. However, some people mention that they, they do generally know something about where people work if they collaborate with someone on a regular basis. You know, if you work closely with someone, you tend to know some things about them. The one case where it mattered for some people is for people who are participating as volunteers instead of as a part of their employment at a company. So almost half of the people I interviewed mentioned giving volunteer software developers a bit more leeway and a bit more help than they would for people who are being employed and paid by a company to do the work. The focus of my research is on collaboration and looking at which people tend to work together on the kernel. With the Linux kernel discussions about patches happening on various mailing lists, it was really the best place to look to understand how people were working together. Now, I see a lot of researchers and those who are new to the kernel making some common errors when using mailing lists to study the Linux kernel. The first is that they focus on uh, LKML, which is the Linux kernel mailing list, and it's the big primary list. However, Quite a few kernel developers that I know almost never actually read uh, LKML or the Linux kernel mailing list because the volume is really high and they just don't get any real benefit from reading the messages. So the real work happens on the many subsystem mailing lists. And there are certainly some valid reasons for studying the Linux kernel mailing list. But if you're interested in looking at how people work together in the kernel on a day-to-day -day basis or how the work actually gets done, the subsystem mailing lists are definitely a better choice. The other issue I see is that people tend to assume the lists of mailing lists that are found on a site called vger.kernel.org is the complete list. So this vger.kernel.org is if you Google like Linux kernel mailing list, this is the site you'll end up on. And it's, it's a big list. Um, they have just over 170 lists on vger.kernel.org but there are over 240 lists that are, at the time of the study, there were over 240 lists referenced in the maintainers file. And there are quite a few lists that are hosted elsewhere that aren't on Beecher. They're um, on places like linuxfoundation.org and a few other sites, including some really big ones like the ARM mailing list. So the maintainers file is really kind of the right place to look for which mailing lists are used for various subsystems or certain areas within the code base. Um, now, this doesn't mean that I'm ignoring the source code and just looking at the mailing list. So one of the things that I included in my research is something that might influence how people work together is whether someone's an active contributor, whether they've made code commits or whether they're a maintainer for some part of the code. For my thesis, I selected one subsystem to focus on for a variety of reasons. I selected the PCI mailing list. Since my research is focused on collaboration between people, I've only included replies to mailing list posts, so not the original message, just the ones that had replies. And on the PCI list, there were over 10,000 replies over the two-year period that I studied from 600 people who were employed at over 130 organizations. 
And on this slide, you can see the larger, darker circles represent companies with employees who reply or are replied to the most on the PCI mailing list, with darker arrows indicating more email exchanges between two companies. And I've only included companies whose employees had the most activity on the mailing list since the image with all 130 organizations was impossible to read. Um, there are also these little loops that show where employees at a company reply to each other. I should mention that there's a bug in the software that I used to generate these because the size of the looped arrow does not correspond to the number of responses between people at a company, but for some reason it's scaled to the size of the circle. Um, but the ones without the loop indicate that either most of the contribution comes from a single individual or that employees from that company just didn't reply to each other on the mailing list. The company that stands out, obviously, on this chart is Google. This isn't surprising since Bjorn, the overall PCI subsystem maintainer, worked at Google. And because of this maintainer role, Google is connected to most, if not all, of the other companies through replies um, from Bjorn to um, related to patches and other matters that were discussed on the list. And you can see the company employees from Lenaro and Arm, for example, reply to each other quite often which makes sense since Lenaro is focused mostly on technologies related to ARM. Likewise, there's a strong connection between Lenaro and TI, again, likely because of the ARM work. But you can also see replies between competitors. So for example, Intel, you can see, has connections to ARM, AMD, and some of their other competitors. Now, this is the image of people, the people who are involved. Um, again, only the most prolific responders showing. Um, and again, the larger, darker circles are people who reply or are replied to the most on the list, with the darker arrows indicating more email exchanges between people. And looking at the most prolific responders on the mailing list explains some of what we saw on the previous company slide. So Bjorn stands out as the maintainer for the PCI subsystem. So again, he works at Google, so that shows some of why Google is so prominent. And you also see people like you know, Arndt Bergman from Lenaro, Alex Williamson from Red Hat, Yinghai Lu from Oracle, along with um, Liu Zhang and Raphael Waisaki from Intel. Now for the PCI list, I also did quite a bit of statistical modeling, specifically a conditional logistic regression model that I am not gonna go into here. Instead, I'll just kinda do some hand waving and move on to the next slide where I talk about what all of this uh, eye chart means. As I mentioned earlier, I'm focused on collaboration between people in the kernel. And since collaboration happens on the mailing lists, I'm using mailing list replies as a proxy for collaboration. The idea was to use a statistical model, in this case for the PCI mailing list, to, to determine which things increase the likelihood of someone replying to a mailing list post. And the model indicates whether something increases the likelihood of a, of a reply, but unfortunately, of course, it's up to me to interpret why that might be the case. There are many things I looked at that increase the likelihood of collaboration, or more specifically, uh, likelihood of replies to mailing list posts being in the two or CC fields of the email is one of the strongest indicators that someone is likely to reply, which isn't surprising since I know a lot of Linux kernel developers have email filters to catch these. Since if I put you specifically on the two or CC field, it's likely that I'm expecting you to reply or at least look at it. And looking at where people contributed code was, was actually a bit tricky because I'm already essentially restricting the data to a subsystem by choosing a mailing list. So I had to look at contributions to the same area of code at a more granular level. So I defined area as a section entry in the maintainers file, which you can see this picture here is uh, just a screenshot of a little, little bit of the maintainers file. Um, and for example, there are around 30 sections that use the Linux PCI mailing list. I also, when I did the analysis, didn't restrict collaboration with each other just to PCI subsystems because many people may work together in other areas as well. So I looked at that too. And people contributing to the same areas of the source code over the previous 63 days, which is um, the average release window for the Linux kernel, this was actually the best indicator of the likelihood of a reply, which again, isn't particularly surprising since people who are intimately familiar with particular sections of the code are probably more inclined to provide feedback or have questions for people discussing 
or in submitting patches in those areas. One interesting result is that people who commit code or are maintainers are more likely to reply to other people, but are less likely to have other people reply to them. It might be that experienced people are more likely to provide feedback on contributions from less experienced participants. This could also be because some maintainers, including Bjorn on the PCI mailing list, send quite a few replies to acknowledge patches that are being merged without any additional discussion. And it would be interesting to see if this remains true on mailing lists where the maintainer doesn't send as many acknowledgments. It was also nice to see that people working for the same organization were also more likely to reply to each other on the mailing lists. It's easy to ping someone who works at your company using other channels or via private email. So it was nice to see that people are having public discussions on the mailing list with others at their company. It's also more likely for people who have had previous interactions on the mailing list in various ways to collaborate, which isn't a surprise if I know you from previous experience having participated in the same threads or replied to you in the past. It makes sense that I might reply to you when you post new patches or other discussions on the mailing list. This could also be because people who work on similar things tend to have interactions and reply to those same people over time. Now, for a few things that were not shown by the model to impact the likelihood of collaboration. Now, this doesn't mean that they doesn't that they that they don't impact it. It just means that the model doesn't show that they do. Um, we'll start with location. In an online community, people contribute from all over the world, and we don't have data on where people live. However, we do have time zone information from the mailing lists. As I mentioned earlier, the people I interviewed talked about how physical location and time zones didn't really matter. Likewise, the, the statistical model provided little to no evidence that people in similar time zones were more likely to collaborate. I think a lot of companies put too much emphasis on having people co-located when it seems like for Linux kernel developers, they can live anywhere and still effectively collaborate with other Linux kernel developers. And I think we're seeing this more and more as well during the during the pandemic. A lot more people are able to work from home or online more effectively than maybe we thought we could. There was a similar result when looking at whether people work for the same type of organization. I looked at whether people were more likely to reply to emails from other people who worked at the same type of organization. For example, if someone who works for a nonprofit are they more likely to reply to someone else who also works for a nonprofit? And again, the model provided no, no evidence that people tend to reply to posts from people who work at similar types of organizations. Now with that, that's actually my last slide about my research. Um, but before I go, I wanted to put in a really quick plug for Open UK, since I'm assuming most of the attendees are based here in the UK. Um, so Open UK is a not-for-profit company focused on collaboration around open technology, which includes open source software, open source hardware, open data here in the UK. And we're bringing together business, public sector, and broader community within the UK to collaborate both locally and globally. And as, as I said, this is, a, this is a nonprofit effort. So we're all, all doing this voluntarily um, to try to make things, make things better in the UK. One of the things we realized is that we have all of this amazing talent around open technologies right here in the UK, but we don't collaborate and work together maybe as much as we should. A lot of us work on global projects and for companies headquartered in other locations, especially the US. For me, I work for VMware. They're headquartered in California and I work on open source projects. Most of the other participants are based in the US. And this means that I spend way more time collaborating with people in other countries and not spending enough time building and supporting my local open technology communities. And at Open UK, we're focused on trying to change this dynamic to provide more collaboration and better visibility for our work to help show people here and around the world that the UK is a great place for working on open technologies. But we're not just focused on those of us already working in the industry. We also need education and learning and bring the next wave of people into the workforce. And this means making sure that people aren't just consuming open source technology, but also that they understand what it is and why doing this work in the open is important. We're always looking for you know, companies to support our work, or if you're interested in helping us with some of the work, you can go to our activities page on the website. We have a big list of committees and most, if not all of them, are looking for volunteers. 
And the best way to keep up with what we're doing is you can go to our website, sign up for our monthly newsletter or follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn if you're interested in getting more involved. We're always looking for, for volunteers. And with that, I will wrap it up. So thank you all for taking the time to listen to me in your evening. And now I can just open it up for questions. Thank you, Dawn. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dawn. Um, yeah, questions. Again, you can use the questions feature, stick your hand up in uh, GoToWebinar or uh, use uh, Twitter at BCS RSSG. Um, one, one question for me, Dawn. Do you think that um, the, like the, the kernel is a, a unique environment or do you think it shows that more organisations could run their projects asynchronously? Uh, I think it's a, I think it's a little bit of both. So, you know, and in, in the one sense, the the kernel is a bit unique in that they've been they've been doing this since the 90s, right? Like the Linux kernel community has not fundamentally changed the way that they work for a really, really long time. Um, so it works really, really well for that. The way that they do things works really well for that community. But I do think that more of us could do could do a lot of our work over over email and asynchronously. I know. It's something I've been trying to actively work on because it's so easy to just, you know, uh, I'll just I'll just set up a meeting with this person so that we can we can chat about this thing. And then what happens is my day is just full of meetings and I can't get any work done. And maybe some of those meetings could have been emails. So I do I do think we should be thinking about how much of our work can be done asynchronously because I suspect that it's a lot more than we think. Thank you very much. Uh, there's a question here from Terence Eden. There's been some recent discussion about whether mailing lists present a high barrier to entry. Do you think a community like Linux Kernel could move to, for example, GitHub issues? Hello, Terence. Um, that's an excellent question. Uh, it, it's something actually that the Kernel has talked about a lot. So I absolutely agree that mailing lists provide quite a quite a large barrier to entry, uh, especially because of the, the processes that they use. And most of us are used to just submitting GitHub pull requests. They've actually looked at moving the kernel to GitHub a few times and done some, some analysis. And um, because of the size of that project and the scale and the way things are broken down, um, it's, there hasn't been a way to make that practical. There are some some limitations in the way that GitHub works that make it not work for the kernel. So I think that um, I think that most projects could easily move to GitHub instead of mailing lists. You know, I, I work on I work on Kubernetes, and we have we have mailing lists, but that's not really where the discussion happens. Generally, the mailing list, you know, are things like you know we've just cut a new release, or hey, there's this big meeting that people should go to. But the discussion generally happens in GitHub pull requests and issues. So I think that, you know, I think that most projects could start to move away from things like mailing lists for the collaboration and move move the collaboration into the tool where the, the source code is. And I think that that tends to work better for a lot of projects. Great, thank you very much, Dawn. Um, I think that's all the questions. Perfect. Um, Thank you. Thank you.